Bananas are great. They taste pretty good, they're healthy, and they even come with their own natural packaging. The first domesticated bananas originated in Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea. So how did they make their way to pretty much every other country, and how did they become so popular? Hi there, I'm Danny Ward, and this is Knowledgeka, the show about anything and everything. So today, we're going completely stark raving bananas. We're diving into a brief history behind one of the most popular fruits in the world. In America alone, the humble banana is very popular. A report back in 2015 showed that bananas were the number one selling item at the American store, Walmart, totaling $405 billion in sales. Worldwide, the main rival to the banana is the tomato. Having said that, the banana is the world's most eaten fruit. 95 million tonnes are produced each year. To put that in comparison, the estimated weight of the entire Great Wall of China is 58 million tonnes. So that's one and a half Great Wall of China shed loads of banana each and every year. The banana's main rival is the tomato. While there are more produced each year, standing at 141 million tonnes, most of this will go into food processing for things like tomato sauces and pastes. Far fewer just eat the tomato as a fruit itself. Banana wins this round, if we were keeping score, which we're not. The banana is an edible botanical berry from the Musa genus biological classification. That's right, bananas are technically berries. A berry is a fleshy fruit without a stone, which is produced from a single ovary in a single flower. Bananas fit the bill. Other botanical berries include grapes, tomatoes, currants, cucumbers, and aubergines, which are also known as eggplants, but actually exclude strawberries and raspberries. Confusing, I know. Things with berries in the name aren't actually berries. Don't even get me started on nuts. I mean, peanuts technically aren't even nuts. They're legumes. <sighs> okay, okay, I said I wouldn't. Today's modern banana comes from two wild species known by their scientific Latin names as Musa acuminate and Musa balbiciana. The first, Musa alcuminate, was originally native to what is now modern day Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and many of the other countries located by the South China Sea. These bananas are considered to be one of the earliest examples of plant domestication by humans. This was right back in 8000 BCE, and it was thought that this was mostly for its fibrous skin, which could be used as a material in its own right. To put this in perspective, 8000 BCE South Africa was just seeing its first inhabitants, the Bantu people, migrating from the north. So yeah, it's a pretty long time ago. The second, Musa balbiciana, was native to eastern India and southern China. They contained big inedible seeds and looked pretty different to the bananas we know today. But over time, these species were crossed through breeding to combine traits. But we'll get to that later. It was Western Arabic Islamic conquerors back in 327 BC that brought these bananas from their native home in Southeast Asia over to Western Asia and Northern Africa. During the Portuguese expansionist efforts, the banana was introduced to European sailors. Eventually, the first explorers and missionaries to the New World over on the Americas brought bananas with them. In the 15th and 16th century, the Portuguese adopted bananas as one of their plantations of choice for their new colonies. The islands of the Caribbean were previously havens of sugar growth, but as deforestation occurred and the draining of the low marshlands happened, this opened up the attractive option of growing bananas. To maximize productivity, just one type of banana was chosen and grown on a mass scale. This practice is still carried out around the world today. The practice of growing a single variety of banana to increase productivity does certainly have its drawbacks. 
This puts the bananas at high risk of disease, and because they are all exactly the same, they are all easily wiped out. One of the main diseases of bananas, and the first notable one, is a fungus called Fusarium, which causes mold growth on the roots of the banana trees. This leads to Fusarium wilt, or Panama disease. Basically, this leads to floppy, droopy leaves. Floppy, droopy leaves aren't ideal for a healthy, happy plant. The disease causes vessels within the plant, known as the xylem, to become blocked, and so nutrient and water flow is quelled. Those sad-looking leaves will eventually dry up and drop off. This leads to the death of the plant, and so no more bananas. The most popular variety of banana in the UK is the Cavendish. Remember that, it comes up in pub quizzes a lot. The Cavendish's popularity isn't just limited to England, however. This variety has dominated the globe since the 1950s, as it was developed to be resistant to Fusarium. It was only in the Victorian era, from the mid-1800s, that bananas were starting to pick up pace. The banana passed from the Caribbean through to the port cities of New York, Boston and New Orleans. They were strange and exotic. It was originally eaten on a plate with a knife and fork. In 1870, American ship captain Lorenzo Dow Baker purchased several bunches of bananas, 160 to be precise, from Jamaica. He then resold these in Jersey City, USA. By 1876, word had obviously gotten around about this rather tasty new fruit. At the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, the first official World's Fair in the US, bananas were selling for 10 cents each, which was quite a lot back then, but they still proved popular. Baker soon found his life to be becoming more and more about bananas. By 1881, he set up L.D. Baker & Co. with Elijah Hopkins, his brother-in-law. By 1885, this transformed into the Boston Fruit Company with the help of American businessman Andrew W. Preston. This really stepped up the importing of bananas, operating at the main ports of Boston, Philadelphia and Baltimore, transporting from 35 banana plantations in Jamaica. In 1899, it was decided that a suitable strategy for good onward growth was to consolidate production, shipping and marketing all under one roof in order to mitigate financial risks. This led to the formation of the United Fruit Company. The United Fruits Company expanded operations greatly, now importing from a wide variety of regions, including Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, Ecuador and Colombia, as well as Jamaica. Eventually, the United Fruit Company was so successful that they formed virtual monopolies in many of these regions. Simply no one else could compete. By the 1930s, the United Fruit Corporation controlled 80 to 90% of the entire US banana market, and they owned 3.5 million acres of land across Central America. During the early era of the United Fruit Company, many political unstable countries dedicated much of their limited resources to banana production. This led to extreme wealth inequality. The rich business political elite profited heavily from this, while those actually doing much of the labour, the working class, were left impoverished. This gave rise to the term banana republics. Military dictatorships were backed by the company as they were foreign business friendly, especially to certain banana companies. This was particularly true in Honduras, where a coup d'etat against existing democratically elected president Miguel Aldavila to remove him from power happened. He was replaced with the military general Manuel Bonilla in 1912. This led to exclusive monopoly rights on all bananas in Honduras for the United Fruit Company. Naturally, there were many backhand deals and bribes involved on behalf of the United Fruit Company with government officials to keep systems like this in place. After all, it was lucrative, except for those actually doing the physical work, of course. It also seriously stunted the economies and foreign investment of these so-called banana republics. Eventually, this had to fall. These predatory business practices were widely criticised as the years went by by highly influential American politicians, 
artists and journalists. Soon the cracks would begin to show. This struggle would soon come to a point. In 1928, workers began a protest in Cienaga, Colombia against the awful working conditions of the time. This resulted in the Massacre de la Bananeras, or the Banana Massacre. The workers went on strike and refused to work until they reached an agreement with those in power for improved working conditions. They demanded the following. Stop subcontractor hiring. Insurance. Work accident compensation. Six day work weeks and appropriate hygienic living quarters. Daily pay increases for those at the bottom of the earning ranks. Less than a hundred pesos a month. A weekly wage. Removal of the office stores. To be paid in actual money, not just coupons. And improved hospital facilities and services. Unfortunately, this didn't go as planned. Several weeks went by without work. And so without any money for the company. Lots of financial losses were starting to accrue. The current president of Colombia at the time, Miguel Abad Mondez, ordered the army to deal with the situation, which resulted in the massacre of as many as 3,000 United Fruit workers. Mistreatment and cruelty from companies such as the United Fruit Company and the supporting governments and Banana Republics is often seen as one of the main contributors behind the growth of communism in many of these regions. Many revolutionary groups were formed during this period seeking change. We now know that these revolutionary movements wouldn't improve many of these people's lives. In many cases, it made the situations even more dire. Industries such as banana production would become state-owned. Due to heavy corruption and political censorship, workers' rights continued to deteriorate and the financial situation of both the workers and the state continued to decline. These former banana republics have had a rocky path to take over the past few decades. Political power struggles and poverty from the poor and corrupt management of the international banana industry led to organized crime gangs and the illegal drug trade to try to fill the gaps. Due to intervention by the US Marine Corps as part of the aptly named Banana Wars in the early 1900s, many of the corrupt and abusive political regimes were brought to an end. The Banana Republics were finally coming to a close. Nowadays, while still not perfect, many of these former Banana Republics have been able to diversify their economies. Education and social welfare programs are in place for many workers. Many of the formerly oppressive political regimes are things of the past. Those at the bottom of the food chain are finally starting to be given more of a chance after many years of unfair struggle through no fault of their own. Next time you go to grab a banana, just remember that relatively cheap, tasty, pre-wrapped fruit has a pretty extensive history that we often don't even think about. And with that, it's time to end today's show. If you did enjoy today's show, please let me know by giving a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button and bell. Think someone might be interested in the tale of the banana? Why not give this video a share? Also, be sure to follow Knowledgeka on social media to keep up to date with everything in Knowledgeka. Links are in the description. I've been Danny Ward, and this has been Knowledgeka. Until next time, stay hungry for factuality.